So um, I've been doing things for the past 25 years that are very different from what many of you have been doing. Um, I have not been doing philosophy directly, um, although uh, I did write my dissertation on Polanyi and Merleau-Ponty and the concept of embodiment. Um, after uh, or close to getting my PhD in 1980, uh, Guillermo and I moved to Toledo, Ohio, and there was a, this is totally ancillary, okay? There was a big blizzard there, a lot of snow there, and then this past winter again. But as I say, that's very ancillary. <laughs> so um, at any rate, when I first went to Duke, um, I was intending to study sociology because at undergraduate school at Beloit, um, I had a wonderful professor, Don Summers, who did a seminar on Merleau-Ponty. And so I had heard that at Duke, Edward Teriakian was there, and I could continue that study. Um, I soon uh, find out, found out, though, that having to take statistics and methodology, that there were a lot of assumptions in the discipline of sociology that I did not really agree, agree with. It was very empiricist focused. And so like many of you, I chanced upon Bill Poteet's seminars and I decided to switch majors even though I was like five years into my sociology degree. Mm. And um, I had to take a year as a special student in Divinity School and then I was admitted to the graduate program. So um, the seminars I, I took with Poteet, Merleau-Ponty, Polanyi, Percy, Kierkegaard. All right, okay, and uh, Ricoeur's book on Freud, which was really, uh, I did not understand that at all. And I did some practice teaching with Poteet on Hannah Arndt. Hannah Arndt. Um, We've talked some about the techniques in the seminars, so I won't go over to that. But I think I was imagine, imagining myself, as some of you are, which is teaching philosophy, um, extending Poteet's work, even perhaps uh, teaching like Poteet. And this was not possible for a number of reasons, um, one of which um, I interviewed all over Northwest Ohio, but unfortunately did not find a good place um, University of Toledo did not have a religion department. They had philosophy, so they were not interested in me. Um, there was a Catholic uh, university college then, but again, my religious studies were kind of oddball and not Catholic. So that, so anyway, eventually I heard um, of a new uh, director of the nursing program at the medical college who had studied at Georgetown and was very interested in nursing and humanities. So with others, I helped develop a nursing and humanities program, um, ethics as well as other pieces of nursing and humanities, taught there for a number of years. This is a long introduction, but it was part of my paper. What was the name of the place where you were? Uh, Medical College Ohio in Toledo. In Toledo. Yeah. Um, so, after a few years, in 1990, I learned that uh, a local Catholic medical center, St. Vincent Mercy, was seeking a bioethicist, and their plan was to, quote, um, resurrect their moribund ethics committee and um, do some teaching, perhaps start an ethics consultation service. Um, so I signed on there, and I was Director of Ethics for 18 years. Um, my responsibilities included working with several different ethics committees um, with education and chairing them. Um, I also served on and developed others, institutional review boards for the study of, for the approval of research using human subjects, and um, did some research myself. I did a lot of teaching. <laughs> primarily episodic, um, short, uh, grand rounds, or case study discussions for doctors, nurses, etc. And I also did ethics consultation. I started that service there. Um, I uh, count uh, around 600 cases that I saw 
within those years. Um, many of them went well, but I'm not going to talk about one that went well today because I could do that, but it wouldn't be as interesting, I don't think, for you. Um, so I am going to talk about one especially that um, has always been haunting, and there, there's that word again that we heard in Kieran's talk. Um, so, let's see where I... So, where, where was the latter place that you worked um, at? St. Vincent Mercy Medical Center in, in Toledo. It, also in Toledo? Yes, okay. also okay. in Toledo. Okay. So, um, when I began to... Okay, I need to back up a little. In the 70s, when I left Duke, the discipline of bioethics was just getting started. And I found it a very interesting field with some relationship to what uh, Poteet was doing. But what, what was interesting to me was that the field was developing very rapidly after the 70s, albeit grounded in older religious, you're welcome, <laughs> religious as well as philosophical um, underpinnings. Um, however, after, okay. Secular by what we did in the 60s Se and 70s. All right, see, Not this is what he said to me yesterday. <laughs> Okay, so, um, and very briefly, a key point in the de development of bioethics was the um, Holocaust, um, not only for the um, atrocities perpetrated on individuals, which later led to the Nuremberg trials, and a series of principles for research involving human subjects, but also simply because of the new technologies that were, that were developed at that time. So I was learning, the discipline was forming, finding its own voice, and to me that was all very interesting. Um, I also want to preface by saying that as I discuss this case, you may assume or think that bioethics is um, kind of out there or not grounded in theory, but in actual fact, it's extremely grounded now. There are thousands and thousands of books that have been written. There's extensive ethical theories out there. Um, every hospital that you go to or would want to practice at will have an ethics committee. Many will have ethicists as individuals. Um, there's also a, I don't have that book, there's also a society, the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities, which has in the past, uh, I want to say five years, come out with um, not only standards for bioethics consultation, but also how to develop competen competencies in doing that. So it's a very um, successful, in a way, discipline, and maybe we all could learn something from that because it's really taken over. Okay, one of the things I have been interested in in bioethics is not so much the cases that go well, but cases that may um, not have gone well. And I would submit to you that whenever there's been a crisis in our society with a case, Quinlan, Cruzan, Shivo more recently, those are cases that are, in a sense, bring us to a crisis and develop our knowledge further. Um, one of the, but being interested in this development, um, a person I met at Cleveland Clinic, Paul Ford, who has um, kind of a disciple of Richard Zaner, a phenomenologist, uh, was interested, like me, in the kind of mistakes or errors or, uh, in a sense, cases that haunt us over the years. And so they uh, brought together from a number of ethicists cases that, in fact, were haunting. Um, it's called Complex Ethics Consultations, Cases That Haunt Us. Um, and these people contributed many first-hand accounts of their struggling um, with certain cases that didn't resolve well according to them. They may not have been mistakes, they might, might not have been errors, but they were very difficult to work through. So I really recommend this book. It's very phenomenological in a way. Um, if any of you are on an ethics committee, it's very good for teaching material as well, maybe even in an ethics class. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk um, about the case that I contributed to this, 
Um, it is a first-hand account, and to my way of thinking, it really reveals the way that ethics deliberation is um, a form of personal knowledge. Okay? It's embodied, it's in a situation, oftentimes a situation which is very difficult. There are a whole host of people involved in the case as well, families, doctors, um, nurses, social workers, pastoral care people, so it's all very complex. However, when we teach bioethics, perhaps in a secular setting, um, oftentimes the theories that we use, um, we do continue to teach um, uh, Bentham and Mill, utilitarianism, and Kant. Um, they're kind of a good um, groundwork, if I can use that word, for bioethics. Um, they can be useful as signposts or clues to what we need to attend to. I particularly, particularly like Kant for his focus on the person as being of ultimate value. I think that's a very um, interesting and useful concept. However, in actual fact, as we're doing bioethics, as we may, you know, we might think of these things, but again, the contingencies of the situation um, bear very little resemblance to a clear and distinct contemplation about the issues or what's going on. So I'm going to read a little bit of this. Um, I'm sorry I don't have copies for you. So embodied knowing, attending from the emerging tradition of bioethics to um, a case that presents itself, um, the suffer but the suffering of the patient, time pressures, contingencies, risk, and the ambiguity of the process, as I've said, stand in sharp contrast to the received accounts of ethical deliberation that we've just briefly um, considered. Um, so, let's see if there was any, I have some side notes on the back, so forgive me. No, I think I've covered that. So this case is called Listening to the Husband, and it was one of the first cases that I was called upon to look at as a new ethics consultant. Um, so it was actually um, very challenging for me, and um, it was basically, I think, number one or number two, the cases that I did. Um, let's see, I talked about the development of bioethics. Um, I want to say a little bit about one of the key issues because it relates to this case, and that is the development of ventilators, okay? And again, these were developed first as um, iron lungs in Denmark. Um, in 57, uh, they were starting, or even before that, they were used in the operating room to sustain patients who had had anesthesia. And then in the 1957s, uh, 57, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this series of questions to the Pope. Um, I'm sure at least one of us is, but this was Dr. Um, Bruno Haidt. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that well. But you can note um, his perplexity about um, ventilators, his ambiguity, and even difficulty in choosing the right words. And he addressed these to the Pope at a conference. First, does one have the right, or is one even under the obligation, to use modern artificial respiration equipment, that took four words back then, in all cases, even those which in the doctor's judgment are completely hopeless? Second, does one have the right, or is one under the obligation, to remove the artificial respiration apparatus, when after several days the state of deep unconsciousness does not improve, if, when it is removed, blood circulation will stop after a few moments. What must be done in this case if the family uh, of the patient and the patient has already received the last sacraments, what if the family urges the doctor to remove the machine? Is extreme unction, now called um, anointing of the sick, I believe, still valid at this time? Third, must a patient plug plunged into unconsciousness through central paralysis but his whose life, that is to say blood circulation, is maintained through artificial respiration and in whom there is no improvement after several days, be considered in fact or legally dead. Do we not have to wait for blood circulation to stop 
in spite of the artificial respiration before considering him dead. And the pontiff responded, um, again, drawing from the very deep Catholic tradition, normally one is held to use only ordinary means according to circumstances of persons, places, times, and cultures. That is to say, means that do not involve any grave burden for oneself or another. A more strict obligation would be too burdensome for most men and would render the attainment of higher, more important goods, spiritual goods, um, more difficult. Life, health, all temporal activities are in fact subordinated to spiritual ends. Um, on the other hand, one is not forbidden to take these measures if one wishes to. And this, I think, is a very central insight of modern bioethics. It's been carried forward um, not only in the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care services, which I almost know by heart, even though I am not Catholic, um, as well as in the thinking of modern bioethics. There's a lot of talk about proportionality, about balances of benefits and burdens. OK, so this is the case listening to the husband, and I bring us back kind of abruptly to that. Two months after I began my position at a Catholic hospital, a Catholic priest uh, requested an ethics consult. Turned out to be my first or second. He related that Ms. Barnes, uh, names disguised, a middle-aged woman on a ventilator with advanced chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, was asking to be taken off the ventilator. How do we respond to this in a Catholic hospital? And I infer that he meant, um, is it, are we allowed morally to withdraw a form of treatment in a Catholic <coughs> hospital? Of course we are. Um, however, there was some confusion and had been confusion over the years for, for a long time. So what is the purpose of an ethics consult? Um, an early definition is um, to seek to identify analyze and resolve ethical dilemmas that occur in the clinical setting. And I think you can hear a lot of critical voicing in there. Um, a definition that I prefer um, is attempting to improve the conversation within a difficult case so that everyone's voices are heard and those who are most important, which most often is the patient, um, because it's the patient's autonomy that we work towards um, to be sure that that voice is heard. Um, so uh, many, I'm not sure how much you know about ethics consultation. If you have questions, please ask at any time. But um, one mode of proceeding with this case would have been to convene an ethics committee. And this involves anywhere from 12 to 24 people, um, it, you know, I tried to do this, the logistics were very difficult, so with the permission of the chair at that time, um, also a Catholic priest, um, I proposed to work more individually on the case, and yet while seeking consultation um, all the way through from other ethics committee members, as well as colleagues at other organizations, such as the medical college. Um, and I did keep in touch with these individuals. So basic steps would be gathering facts, speaking to all those involved. I mentioned identifying and analyzing the ethical issues. Um, oftentimes there would be a care conference, and these were very useful, where the attending physician would bring together key family members or all family members, as well as other disciplines in the room and try to work through what the um, ethical conflicts were or ethical disagreements were. And I would assist in that and try to resolve the case. But this was not done in this case. So first I spoke with the nurse manager um, who relayed that nursing staff were very frustrated. Um, they had witnessed the patient repeatedly expressing a desire to be taken off the ventilator. So she was a, a, a person with decisional capacity. She was not comatose. She would also refuse food and most medications. Social background. 
Um, she was married. Her husband was strongly approved to removal of life support. It sometimes seemed to the nurses that the patient was being treated against her will um, simply, simply because the attending physician feared a lawsuit. That was their view. Um, also, the nurses had suspicions that Mr. Barnes was in some way manipulating the, the situation. The patient appeared to be, to the nurses, um, to be more guarded, more compliant with the medical regime, more willing to go along with ventilator support when he was there. So a, a number of questions are already being raised. Was this in fact true? Um, was the situation being dominated by the patient's husband? Um, on the other hand, the patient's husband was not in favor of a full code. That is, if her heart should stop, um, he did not want to attempt resuscitation. Obviously, if you think about it, this is inconsistent with not be, being willing to remove the ventilator. But perhaps he, like many other families, felt that if a, um, an arrest occurred, in a sense, the death would not be in their, the family's hands, but rather um, an act of God or an act of nature. So um, I did speak to the physician. Uh, he explained that he often withdrew ventilator support um, when the whole family was in agreement, um, however, not when other family members disagreed. Um, later on, by the way, this physician became uh, the director of the palliative care department and very instrumental in um, our linkage with hospice. So I'm not exactly sure why he took this position. Um, Another problem, the patient's out-of-state insurance did not, uh, was restrictive in, term, in terms of our trying to find an extended care facility. Um, they were attempting to, quote, wean the patient from ventilator support, but were unable to do so because every time, as they do, they would start to turn down support. She would become very anxious and indicate that she wanted it back on. So with a nurse's help, um, because I had never spoken to someone on a ventilator before, and I wanted somebody else there who, may, who might have been able to understand her better to accompany me. So we went into the room, the patient's room. Um, the patient could speak a little when she blocked the tracheostomy tube. Um, it was a very odd kind of speech, kind of gasping, very um, difficult to understand but she could, um, I felt, answer yes and no questions. But I felt very awkward, as you can pick up, very concerned about the seriousness of the situation. The questions I asked included, after some reasonable introductions about my role, etc., do you want to stop the ventilator machine? And she indicated yes. Do you understand that you will die when the ventilator is stopped? Yes. Do you know that your husband is against this? Yes. Should we listen to him? No. Do you want him included in this decision? No. Um, so this obviously raised a whole bunch of other questions, um, but it seemed fairly straightforward. Are you asking the no, question? No, no. Okay. From first glance, and I, I indicate first glance, that it was a very cut and dried ethics case, autonomy versus paternalism. Not sure what the justification of the paternalism was. There didn't seem to be a good one. Um, but I took this um, uh, into my uh, consideration. And I, I did explain to Ms. Barnes, this is the case, that I do not make decisions. I provide recommendations or I provide um, a range of alternatives that would be ethically acceptable, et cetera. But I said that I would talk to her physician. So kind of in a textbook approach, um, I was sitting there at the nurse's station. Um, and I had already read the chart, by the way. That's a first step you, I left out. Um, I was sitting there peacefully trying to write a really cogent um, ethics note. We do write in the medical chart, and this is not simply to present a um, fixed reality, as you might think, but as a form of communication because there are so many people involved in every case 
that if you don't write there, you're not going to get a whole picture of what's going on. But my notes were obviously very different from doctor's notes as the hospital attorney remarked to me one time. Um, he said that I kind of introduced a narrative, more narrative approach. Um, our attorneys were all English majors, which I thought was excellent. Um, so I was sitting there writing this great um, chart, trying to be very careful, and it happened that uh, Mr. Barnes called into the unit and was speaking to the social worker. Um, and there was a lengthy conversation. The social worker related to me that uh, Mr. Barnes was almost, in a sense, losing it. He was very concerned, very anxious, very frightened by the whole situation as well as very adamant about not taking the ventilator off. And the social worker said to me, you know, it might not be a good idea for somebody else to be introduced to the case at this time. So again, being very new, um, I took that into account as well. You, you can tell I was trying to feel my way about where my authority was and uh, where my power was within this situation. By the way, the doctor also did not think that um, an ethics consult was needed. And I took that too much to heart as well. Um, so I, I write this note, and with great hopes, I return to the unit a few days later, only to find that my carefully thought out program had not been followed whatsoever. Um, the, all, the weaning was still going on unsuccessfully. The, um, uh, the patient, Ms. Barnes, was continuing at times to voice wanting to be off the ventilator and yet at other times saying that, you know, she didn't because she would become very panicky and scared. Uh, you know, so what I needed what, to... What were you recommending, could you say? I'm sorry. What, I, yeah, I skipped that. Thank you. So what I, what I said was that uh, Ms. Barnes was the primary decision maker. We should listen to her. And I recommended that the medical team continue as well as to document conversations with her because all, all we really had was a snapshot at that time of what her wishes were. And it's really important to get um, some form of, uh, if not consistency, a, um, a commitment over time because it's a very serious decision. So that's what I wrote. And um, again, I was encouraging the doctors and other professionals to do that as well as to chart it so we could know what she really wanted. Does that help? Yes, thanks. Okay. Was there a site consult? No. A site consult was probably not needed because um, even to my uh, an inexpert viewpoint, she was clearly a person with decisional capacity. Okay, in other cases, yes, we have. Uh, but I mean, like depression, that was not thought to be a potential issue going on? No, I don't believe so. Good question. And because that comes kind of a routine. Yeah. And, and I mean, you, you've made the judgment, and it's, it's an obvious judgment. But somehow, routinely, it's a nowadays. Maybe it wasn't then, I don't yeah. know, or mm -hmm. not in that hospital. Mm -hmm. it certainly varies from region to region. Sure. Uh, no, it was not routine in our hospital. Um, if we would allow, we would ask the attending physician to make the first call as to whether a further consult was needed, and we did do those in many cases. Sometimes repeat consults. So anyway, the pattern continued. Um, uh, Mrs. Barnes refused transfer to a nursing home. Um, she wanted the, she was very ambiguous, ambivalent about whether she wanted the ventilator stopped. Um, it remained to some extent a life and death decision. A lot of time went by as far as I perceived it. Um, it was now October. Um, there were Halloween decorations going up. Um, ironic in my way of thinking because of the kind of trivial way we think about death in this society. We make it a holiday to be celebrated and yet here was my poor patient suffering in an ongoing basis. 
um, close to death, one way or another, stuck in her situation and with me feeling um, powerless or not having enough power. Um, eventually... Did you want to make the decision? No, I did not. And what we, do you mean by powerless? Um, by powerless, what I have, what would have liked to have seen was more incorporation perhaps of the full ethics committee. Um, that would have given more power to the situation, although perhaps the same outcome. So that would have been one. And perhaps others of you can think of other courses of action that may have been helpful in the situation. Surely this is a learning case and you're welcome to do that. Um, another, I think also because I was new, not only did I sense a lack of authority, but perhaps I had not proven myself in the hospital setting, and perhaps my word did not carry as much weight as it would later. So, Was anyone talking to the husband about his attitude? Only the doctor, and this, and the social worker. And remember, she told me, probably not, probably best, yeah. and I listened to that, I think, unfortunately. Yeah. That was not the best way to, to assert my professional it being. Seemed, it seems the narrative changed a little bit. At first, she seemed unequivocal. Yes. Right. But now, she's now saying, I don't know. Mm -hmm. that and that's, that's key, okay. because you definitely did not want to go forward right. if somebody's equivocal okay. about this. So that was a key point in the case. Um, people did start talking with her more and more frequently. Uh, eventually, whether she just uh, capitulated or agreed, I don't know. One of the things I say in my paper is that all too often, when someone agrees with what we think they should do, we assume the ethics, the ethics issue is solved. And that is not always the case. Okay. Um, but at any rate, she did agree finally to be transferred to a extended care facility. Um, she did die after several weeks. This is not to say that she wouldn't have died in the hospital. Same thing might have happened, um, given the diffi difficulty of getting her off the ventilator. Um, and so in this book, we were asked to reflect some on the case, the cases that we contribute, contributed. And I'm aware of things I might have done differently, um, such as the full ethics committee, even though it's very difficult to convene. Um, we have convened it on other occasions, um, notably a um, sperm retrieval case after death. Um, that usually kind of wakes people up. Did you hear me? <laughs> a sperm retrieval case after death. We use the full ethics <laughs> committee for that, but I'm not going to talk about it unless we really oh, have on. time. <laughs> no. if, we, if we get through all of this and we have time, I will talk about it because it's also a fascinating case religiously and ethically. So, um, you know, on the positive side, I did proceed quite slowly. I tried to talk to other people, um, tried to hit all the main details of ethics consultation that I've shared with you. Um, I, I remind myself that the ethicist is not the source of the disease or the family dis dysfunction. This is a problem for many ethicists. We cannot solve everything, and we cannot really take it on ourselves to make everything clear and plain. It just doesn't happen that way. And again, these difficult cases are the source, I believe, of the discipline and of ethicists moving forward with new language and um, new sedimented meanings. Um, I have a couple of questions for discussion. Um, I guess I would like to raise just the first one um, to open discussion and then see what comments and questions you all may have. I don't know how my time is going either. Well, I don't need it. It's 4.30, but I'm not quite sure when we started. Um, so I'm almost done, essentially, so right? 4.35 is what it says. Uh, do you, you want? You, we were 15 minutes late. So I, I think, think we were. Okay. You want to have discussion after you're through, and then have discussion. I after think that would make sense. Yeah. Okay. We're, okay. We're, okay. Okay. we're kind of different. Okay. But yeah. Ellen, can you just talk? Why does this haunt you? I. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm not clear about. Okay. okay. Um, a woman is ambivalent. Her husband is clear. The doctor thinks an ethics consult isn't necessary. So, what is it about it 
that haunts you? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's partially the sense that um, it went on for a long time. It was very ambiguous. I think also partially it may be just a personal apprehension that I could have done something and I didn't. I don't think that's actually realistic, mm. necessarily. Um, I think also um, I tend to imagine the nurses uh, dissatisfied with the outcome. Um, so that's, that's why. And I, um, all of the cases in this book talk, go ahead, you wanted well, to respond. Just, uh, could you just talk a little bit more about the nurses? Why, if the woman herself is ambivalent and becomes distressed when they try to wean her off this thing, why are the nurses thinking? I mean, I could understand if she was absolutely clear mm -hmm. and other people were keeping her on the ventilator, then I as a nurse mm -hmm. would be very distressed. But if she herself is not clear mm -hmm. and gives all kinds of signals that what she said isn't what she wants, mm -hmm. why are the nurses upset? I think they were upset because nurses taking care of somebody day by day. They live with the ambiguity and the stress of doing that. They also, I believe, tend to blame physicians for many of the predicaments that we get into in the clinical setting. So they may have adopted that as well. However, um, it would have been good to, I believe, for me to talk with them more as well and unpack what they were feeling but mean? part of it is imagining, and um, I don't know if in your philosophy teaching, very often you feel that you've made a, a very difficult, complex, haunting mistake, perhaps in your personal lives, and I'm not asking you to talk about that, but um, I'm really not, and it's, it's a danger when you teach ethics because sometimes people reveal stuff that they really, in retrospect, don't want to, but I guess that's why my sense of, my own sense of powerlessness, perhaps, realistic, I don't think it was wholly realistic. Mm -hmm.